Okay, good day, brothers and sisters. Um, we are going, um, we are continuing with our study on Revelation. And um, it was supposed to be, initially it was supposed to be a study on Revelation chapter one only, but I've decided to um, do more studies on the book of Revelation. Now, today I want to look at Revelation chapter 2 from verses 1 to 7. So Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 to 7 is um, the letter to the church in Ephesus. Okay. Now, to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. So obviously... This is um, the words of Jesus Christ, because we know from um, Revelation chapter 1, we know that Jesus Christ is the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, and he's walking among the um, seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. So he commends them for being hard workers, uh, doing good deeds, and also persevering under trials and suffering and tribulation. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. So these guys um, have a certain level of discernment, but their discernment only goes up to a certain level. Um, I'll show you now. You will see just now what I mean by that. So they don't tolerate wicked people, but... Up until a point. Let's see. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Now listen carefully. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. The reason why I'm saying that they only have discernment up to a certain point is because they have forsaken their first love. Now, their first love is Jesus Christ. For that, that should be the first love of any Christian, any Sincere believer, um, your true love, your first love should be Jesus Christ. Okay, so if you if your first love is not Jesus Christ, then obviously you you are um, seeking something else in His place. You are putting something else in His place, or you are under the illusion that you should. Have Jesus plus something else or someone else. All right. Now, if we go and look at the history of the um, church in Ephesus, and when you go and you read the book of Acts, and you look at Acts chapter 19, you'll see that Paul had quite a hard time in Ephesus when he went there. Because, uh, Paul. First of all, he had to explain to them that they needed the Holy Spirit. Okay. Then he needed to explain to them that having idols is not going to help him. Worshipping idols is a pagan practice. Um, it will cause you to end up in hell. Okay. The moment he started preaching Jesus, a whole group of pagans, basically a pagan cult in the city of Ephesus, um, went up against him. And they cried out, Blessed is um, Artemis, the, um, the god of Ephesus. Now, what's interesting is Artemis is also named Diana. Okay, and this is a goddess associated with the moon. Okay, it's basically the same goddess that. Uh, 
is spoken of when when uh, people mention Ishtar and Inanna and so on. She's basically seen as a goddess of light, of wisdom and so on. She's a light bearer. Now that should immediately make the sirens go off in your way because what is light bearer and what is someone who pretends to have light? What is that? That is spirit of Antichrist, yes, but it's also more specifically related to the adversary, to Satan himself. Because the name Lucifer um, is means light bringer, okay? It can also be associated with a light bearer, but the thing is, the Apostle Paul warns us and he says that a light bearer uh, Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So he's a light bearer and his light looks good. But it is the ultimate deception. Okay? It's the ultimate deception. Now that's the problem. In Ephesus, you'll see that the moment that Paul started preaching the gospel, You'll see that there's a violent reaction. Now, you see, you see this time and time again with missionaries and so on. We do missionary work. You can go anywhere overseas. In an in a African country, you can go to somewhere in Canada or the United Kingdom, Australia, anywhere. You can talk about Buddha. Nothing will happen. You can talk about Allah and Muhammad. Nothing will happen. You can talk about Krishna. Nothing will happen. But the moment you mention the name above all names, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, immediately there's, an, there's a reaction. Why? Because those of you who are acquainted with the research done by the late Dr. Michael Weiser will know that um, when you look at Deuteronomy 32 verses 8 and 9, and you look at it, in the way that it is phrased in the Dead Sea Scrolls and also in the Septuagint, you'll see that it says that God divided the nations according to the sons of God or the heavenly beings. Okay, The Masoretic text says according to the sons of Israel or the Israelites. But research by Dr. Michael Weiser has shown that the correct reading is the one that comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Septuagint because that's the one, that's the earliest known wording of Deuteronomy 32 verses 89. So if you are acquainted with that research, then you will know that uh, different pieces, uh, different regions on the earth and different countries have been allocated to certain principalities and entities, okay? We also um, read about one of those principalities in the book of Daniel, where, um, we, where they, we see the, the prince of um, Persia, okay? There's also another one mentioned, the prince of Greece. Now, obviously, these are fallen entities, okay? Who are... Um, they are basically in control over a certain region. Now, the same with Ephesus. There was a principality in control here. And in any place that you go on this earth, the moment you speak, you mention the name of Jesus Christ, these principalities react. And there's a whole spiritual atmosphere there that gets disturbed because they know who Jesus Christ is and they are fearful of it. And they will do anything in the power. They will sweep everyone up to attack the missionary, to falsely accuse the missionary, to um, shout insults at the, at the missionary in order to get the missionary to go away. Now, they tried the same thing with Paul. Paul didn't go away. Instead of going away, he remained there for months. And in the end, I think he was like two or three years in Ephesus. Okay. Now, this um, fallen angel who appears as a woman, in this case, Diana or um, Artemis, also known as Inanna or Ishtar, this entity 
had a certain form of control over the region of Ephesus. Okay. And the moment Paul mentioned the name of Jesus, there, there was a violent reaction. Now, if we understand that old background, getting back to Revelation 2, Revelation 2, chapter 1 to 7, we see that John is um, receiving these words from Jesus for the letter that he needs to write. And one of the things that Jesus warned Ephesus about is that um, he says in verse 4, Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how, you, how far you have fallen. In other words, he's basically saying to the church in Ephesus that you have forsaken the love that you had first, the love for Jesus, okay? And you are under the impression that you need Jesus plus someone or something else. Now, I will propose to you that the church in Ephesus was in a constant struggle between going back to the pagan practices of the pagan cults in Ephesus. Um, and obviously they were persecuted. I mean, he says it here clear, clearly, um, you have endured the hardships uh, for my name and have not grown weary. So they haven't grown weary, so they don't give up. Now the devil tries another technique, and this technique is more subtle. His direct attacks didn't help, but now he tries a technique that's more subtle. And that is by infiltrating the fellowship in Ephesus with strange teachings and so on. In this regard, it is mentioned, however, that in verse 6, but you have this in your favor, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now, the Nicolaitans were uh, an obscure cult. Um, not much is known about them, but it seems from research that people have done that the Nicolaitans were basically Gnostics. Okay, they um, they called themselves followers of Jesus, but they they held on to the Gnostic teachings. All right, so they saw knowledge as more important um, than love for God and love for your fellow man. Okay, that's the problem of Gnosticism overall. So this church in Ephesus had. They had um, discernment up to a certain degree. They had enough to discernment to see through the, the Gnostic um, agenda of the Nicolaitans, but they couldn't see through certain other false teachings. Okay? The, this principality that was over Ephesus constantly swept people up against them, and when the direct attack, attack didn't succeed, he tried a more subtle attack, and that is by infiltrating the church or the fellowship with strange teachings. And many times these strange teachings are the lies that tells you, the lie being told to you that Jesus is not enough. You need Jesus plus something or someone else. And this, it would seem, was the main problem in the church of Ephesus, okay? Now, later on in verse 7, the final verse um, in the letter to the church in Ephesus, it says, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, this reminds us of what Jesus Christ said during his earthly ministry, and when he said this, he quoted the prophet Isaiah a lot. Jesus Christ said that let those who have ears to see, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. Those who have eyes to see, let them see. He was quoting the prophet Isaiah because that's something the prophet Isaiah said a lot. He says, if you, those of you who have eyes to see, see. Those who have ears to hear, you must hear. The thing is that Jesus Christ knew that people who were religious, okay, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he knew that they were physically not blind, but spiritually they were blind. So are you spiritually, are your spiritual eyes open or are, they, are you blind? You see, it comes back again to the discernment and the only way in which you can have true discernment is 
when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and um, when the Holy Spirit gives you that gift of discernment. That's the only way. Okay? There's no, there's no one else who can give you the gift of discernment. It's only the Holy Spirit. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, the, the church in Ephesus heard some of the things that the Holy Spirit said to them, but not all. Their ears were deaf to certain things. And that's why they have forsaken their first love. Okay? To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, what's interesting here is in the paradise of God, we know that you have the tree of um, the knowledge of good and evil, as well as the tree of life. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is one thing. It's um, the tree that Satan tempted Adam and Eve with. He said, if you eat of the fruit of this tree, you will surely not die. You will become like God in knowing good and evil. We know that the whole lie that he told Eve. But now the Lord says, if you are victorious, in other words, if you keep your faith until the end, if you are there until the, until the end, I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life. That's, that's huge. That's amazing. The tree of life is the very tree itself in paradise, which harbors life. Okay. This is, this is the very tree which forms the center of paradise. We human beings didn't have the right. We don't have the right to eat from the tree of life. But the Lord says, if you endure to the very end, you will be victorious and I will give you the right to eat from the tree of life. In other words, you will have life eternal. And, you know, at this moment, where we are on planet Earth and where we are in this world, we, with our human understanding, cannot comprehend the aspect of eternal life. We can't comprehend it. It's simply too amazing for us to understand. And that is why the Bible also says that no eye, what, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, um, so amazing will the things be that God has prepared for us. We know that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And here we have another promise. I will give you to eat from the, the fruit of the, uh, the tree of uh, life which is in the paradise of God. But once again, one of the key words here is repentance. If we go back to verse 5, consider how far you have fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. In other words, go back to your sound teaching that you had at the beginning. Don't listen to false doctrine and repent of the false doctrine that you did. So don't go back and pretend as if nothing has happened. Repent of the uh, false teachings that you follow and then go back to the sound teaching that you had in the beginning and continue with that. And obviously repentance is, um, has, has sadly become a swear word in, in many churches today. They don't want to talk about repentance. But we know the Bible says that repentance is absolutely crucial. So that's it for Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. And um, let me just um, end this with a prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you in the wonderful name above names, the, names of, the name of Jesus Christ, through the powerful working of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you uh, for everything. Lord, we thank you for your word which is the truth. Lord, please sanctify us in your truth. Your word is the truth, Lord. Lord, please help us that we will endure and that we will listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, Lord. Please make our ears deaf to any false doctrines. Lord, please help us to have the armor of God on, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. 
which is your living word. Lord, we thank you for your word, the light which, which drives away the darkness. We praise and we glorify your name. Lord, please guard our hearts, guard our thoughts, guard our minds, our speech. Please, please cleanse our bodies, minds, and souls, Lord, and help us to focus on Christ Jesus, our wonderful counselor, our Lord and our Savior. I pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.